Welcome, everyone. I'm really um, appreciative to be here today with our partners at Equidem. Uh, my name is JJ Rosenbaum with Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum. And uh, we're here today to present some very important research. We're going to take about 40 minutes to present that research and then have about 20 minutes for questions and comments from those of you who are joining us. Uh, so I want to first start by uh, asking everyone who's joined to please place their name and their organization in the chat so at least we have a sense of who is in the room. Uh, I want to flag that this event is being recorded uh, and it's also going out live uh, and so just just to be aware of that. Um, unfortunately, we've had um, some logistical challenges on interpretation and so we are only doing uh, the event in English today. However, if you would like more information in Arabic or other languages, please let us know and we'll work to follow up and make that available. Um, I also just want to flag um, as participants that you're not able to turn on your mic or your video, but please do place comments and questions in the chat um, and we will be um, paying attention to those and also bringing those back around at the end. So feel free to add your questions and comments throughout the discussion uh, and then we'll have a specific time at the end to answer them. Uh, so to kick us off, I just wanted to remind many of us, I'm seeing many folks in the room that I know and I know are also experts from doing this work for a long time. There are, the ILO estimates are that there are 244 million migrant workers around the world, that that makes up at least 3% and probably more of the global population and more a larger percentage of workers. Um, and we also know that our labor migration systems at the national level and at the bilateral level are in many ways stacked against workers. Workers um, are trying to negotiate fair working conditions across global supply chains and value chains across transnational borders. Um, and, and, and what the research shows from the Qatar corridor is that they're facing extreme discrimination and exploitation and that we have to do better. So um, we're really um, honored to be here and making uh, this research available in, in collaboration with Equidem, which uh, Equidem is a human rights organization that uh, a human rights charity working globally and locally to promote the rights of marginalized communities and to track and create accountability for serious violations. Um, they have a team of field experts and field investigators working together around the world. And we're gonna hear uh, both from Mustafa, who's the founder of the organization, and also from Jeffrey, one of those field investigators, uh, to both present the information and, and help make everyone aware of how much workers ha have put on the lines in order to make this investigation, of it, make this information available. Um, I think what we are hoping today that we're doing is pulling those workers up to the global conversation about what's happening, not only in Qatar with migrant workers, but specifically in hotels leading up to the World Cup, uh, which will be in less than four months. And, and as you'll hear today, we have a long way to go to get there. Uh, we have hotel chains that are making um, significant profits extracted from the work of migrant workers. And we have FIFA, where a hospitality is a major profit center for the games. Um, and yet we have migrant workers on the, on the front lines of serving players, guests, and uh, officials in, in, in multinational hotels that are facing significant discrimination and abuse. Um, just as a, a reminder, um, the research today we're presenting comes from two years of interviews with workers themselves. Um, over 80 workers participated in interviews in 13 out of 17 of FIFA's partner hotels. Um, they come from countries including Bangladesh, Ghana, India, Indonesia, Kenya, Morocco, Nepal, the Philippines, Thailand, and Uganda. And the field investigative work was done by migrant workers themselves um, who understand these issues very deeply uh, and who were able to reach much more deeply into what's happening than the corporate social responsibility and other top-down corporate efforts. And, and so I think that's going to be the takeaway that you're, you'll hear from us after the, invest, after the research is pre presented, um, is that these uh, corporate social responsibility efforts, both at the level of the hospitality firms and FIFA, are wholly insufficient 
and that we're not going to have decent work conditions for migrant workers um, until we have workers and worker organizations and unions at the table. Uh, so I first want to introduce and pass to Mustafa Kadri, who is the founder and chief executive officer of Equidem. Um, in that capacity, he provides strategic direction and project management and has over 20 years of human rights research and advocacy experience. Um, and, uh, you know, this report really would not be happening without his leadership. Uh, we're really, um, so we'll pass to him. And then and secondly, Jeffrey Owino, who is an investigator with Equidem, is going to speak, and he has been on the front lines of talking to workers and creating this research in Qatar. Um, and so it's we're really appreciative to have his expertise here as well. Uh, I will, as a, I think I failed to introduce myself, <laughs> so I'm JJ Rosenbaum with Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum, and we uh, are an organization that works uh, across global value chains, labor migration corridors, and global financialization. And so this work uh, is really at the center of, of our commitments and what we do. Uh, so let me pass now to Mustafa and then to Jeffrey, who will speak and summarize the findings in the report. Right, thank you so much, JJ, uh, for that introduction. And also, um, I'm, I'm Mustafa Kadri. I'm the founder and CEO of Equidem. I wanted to first start off by thanking JJ and Global Labor Justice International Labor Rights Forum for their incredible support, um, their expertise, um, and their drive on this report. It's been really two years of very solid hard work uh, in putting this together. Yes, we focus on the hotels that are at the heart of the World Cup in Qatar, but we also look at hotels from the same brands across four Gulf countries in total. And when we started this work, it was in the depths of the global COVID pandemic, when our teams on the ground were really hearing about these really shocking cases of abuse and impacts of COVID. And it ends with the World Cup in Qatar, the most prestigious sporting event in the world, literally months away. I also want to thank um, all of our migrant worker investigators on the ground who are incredibly dedicated, incredibly professional, but also so brave, given the risks for any kind of independent human rights work, who not only document what workers are facing, but also provide their expertise to help us to understand why these things are happening and how we should try to address them. But on a human level, themselves often are subject to exploitation, and of course have to deal with the reality of these workers who are suffering. And so it's very hard to convey and understand what they have gone through over the last two years having to deal with these issues. So we really thank them for um, their, their work. And we also really thank Joffrey Owino for joining today, one of our great investigators who was one of the people involved in the research. Um, so today we are releasing the executive summary of the report. Um, the full report itself will be available in roughly two weeks time. However, obviously the executive summary does set out the key findings of our research. And what I wanted to do for you was to just set out some of um, uh, the, uh, the findings of that in, in a very brief presentation. So um, if it's possible just to put up the uh, presentation slides, I will run through those um, for you. But um, to begin with, while that's being set out, um, organized, is, you know, the, the title of our report is We Work Like Robots. And this is something that one of the workers that we spoke to mentioned to us um, in the last year or so within the two years of doing this research. One of the things that really struck us and struck me personally was what a critical role the hospitality sector and hotels in particular play in the Gulf. As you may know, during the pandemic, there were places where people were quarantined. There were places that were often turned into places for medical services. And of course, with the World Cup starting, they're one of the key features for football teams, for corporate sponsors, and of course, tourists to be going to the tournament. And as someone myself who actually uh, goes to obviously hotels regularly to, to do my work, 
you know, you realize very quickly just how invisible this workforce is anyway. Obviously, migrant workers are the engine room of Qatar, but yet when you go to other sectors, you'll often see them uh, very clearly visible to you. Uh, hotel workers are often quite invisible. So I'll go to the, um, the second slide in my presentation. And I thought it might be useful for us to start off with a little bit of uh, context in terms of the situation for migrant workers in Qatar and in the other countries that we research. Now, many of you will obviously know these details, while others of you may not. Now, one key thing to talk about is in the 12 years since Qatar was selected to host the World Cup this year, back in 2010, FIFA, the world governing body for global football, did not require of Qatar or any of the other countries bidding for the event to have any kinds of human rights assessments or policies. And that really figured very clearly in the first few years of Qatar's preparation. Now, most people globally don't know much about Qatar and don't think much about migrant workers in the Gulf, but in Qatar, they are over 80% of the population. They are over 90% of the private workforce. And historically in Qatar and in the Gulf, the way that the migrant worker labor regime is governed is through what is known as the kafala system. Under that system, sponsors who are typically citizens or residents or corporations in, in these Gulf countries um, have significant control over the lives of migrant workers. They have historically had the power to uh, check whether workers can change jobs or leave the country. And also, apart from the law, in practice, they have very significant control over their lives. In Qatar and in the other Gulf countries that we've, we did this research in, it is also still a crime for workers to leave their job, even in situations where they are being exploited. I will talk a little bit about the ways that there have been reforms, reforms in Qatar over la, in, in recent years, but historically this has been one of the most significant issues for workers, that workers are trapped in the situation where they cannot leave their job and that they may even get punished, even through pro criminal prosecution, for trying to run away. Of course, in the Gulf, freedom of association rights are strictly limited. Trade unionism is either unlawful or totally illegal, including for nationals. And many of the work terms have historically been completely unregulated, so that whilst in the law there are some significant protections, even if they have limitations, there's historically been very poor inconsistent regulation of those protections. Lastly, migrant workers are subjected to significant social exclusion and exclusion from social protection. And this really is the landscape within which FIFA decided to choose Qatar to host the World Cup without any, in, back in 2010, any human rights requirements. Now, what's really interesting is in the last particularly four years, Qatar has gone through quite a significant shift in terms of its reform of labor laws and policies and practices and increase significantly the resources and the political will to ensure there is some degree of labor compliance. Now, there are a number of things that have been done, but in summary, this include increasing and uh, the number of ongoing labor inspections and increasing the number of labor inspectors, instigating a mandatory non-discriminatory minimum wage of Qatari Rials 1000, improved payment systems, which means that the monitoring of whether workers are being paid has been in, in, improved, as well as setting up a wage fund, although it is still in the process of being uh, uh, set up, setting up a wage protection fund for workers. Uh, resources has also been put into increasing the efficacy and the speed of the uh, labor court system for workers to address typically the most uh, common types of labor issues around wages. And critically, there has more recently been the setup 
uh, or in some enterprises, although only a minority of enterprises in the entire country, of joint worker committees where representatives of employers and workers meet to talk about working and living conditions. And this includes in World Cup hotels. Uh, if, if I could have this, the next slide, please. So it was within that environment that we did our research. As JJ mentioned, we did interviews with over 80 migrant hotel workers. We actually approached over 800 in total, but of those, the vast majority, 90%, were unwilling to speak to us, even though all our interviews were conducted one-to-one -one anonymously by other migrant workers in safe spaces, and the vast majority of those interviews were done face-to-face. The purpose of this research really was to look at the labor and living conditions for workers in the main hotel brands that are partners with FIFA for the World Cup. So we looked at obviously what's happening in Qatar, but also what is happening in these hotel brands in some of the neighboring Gulf countries. And what's really interesting is that these brands will actually manage their presence in the region as one group. And of course, as we know, the conditions for workers are often very similar across these different Gulf countries. Now, of the workers that we interviewed, 54 of those workers were directly on FIFA World Cup hotels. And we covered 13 of the 17 official FIFA World Cup hotel groups. Now, you'll notice it's very, very small print, but you can see in our report. But our investigations covered some of the biggest international brands in, in the hotel industry. We spoke to workers from a core group, from the Ducet, Esdan Holding Group, Intercontinental, Kempinski, Marriott, Movenpick, Ritz, Rotana, Steinberger, Tivoli, and Wyndham. So a really wide variety of major hotel corporations and brands. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. Now, we found a range of issues which are detailed in our report. However, um, the uh, one of the key things that was very common amongst the workers that we spoke to was complaints around nationality and gender discrimination. It was a very common issue to hear from Asian and African workers that their pay, their conditions, or their job prospects were different and they felt were less favorable because they were from Africa or Asia or from specific countries. Some of them spoke about how workers from other countries or those who seemed to be of an Arabic, Arabic language background were treated more favorably or that had better chances for promotion. Many of the women that we interviewed said that they were paid less or had the same sort of discrimination uh, but uh, on the basis of them being women. And this was a very, very common issue that came up in our investigations. And what we try to do as much as possible is to convey that in the testimonies of workers, which is, you know, there's a lot of that in our report. And you see here one of the powerful quotes from one of the workers. I'm not sure whether um, people are able to see the presentation. And if you're not able to see it, I apologise. But for those who cannot see it, I'll, I'll just... Um, uh, I can quote uh, from one of the workers. Um, here, the salary is not about what you bring to the table. I will never get the same salary as an Arab colleague. There is a lot of discrimination against people from Africa. We are only hired in some types of jobs, security, housekeeping, the kitchen. Now, um, it, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, people can see the, the presentation uh, and whether we can, we can address that. So um, excellent, excellent. Um, but that testimony was really quite typical of many of the workers that we spoke to. And again, even then hearing that is very hard to convey that sense that our investigators faced and something Joffrey will speak about as well is apart from the exploitation apart from this being a human rights violation, how it makes a human being feel when they have come far away, often in a very challenging way, to a new country, which is very strange and very different to them, and then to feel that they're less than a full human being. And it's really hard to understand how this can still be happening 
even though, of course, there are many challenges with any kind of labor reform, and of course, Qatar does have over 2 million migrant workers, but with 12 years since Qatar won the rights to host the World Cup, why, particularly at the heart of these World Cup luxury hotels, that this basic issue is still happening? Um, if you could just turn on, turn to the next slide. Another issue that was found and very common amongst the workers we interviewed was around wage theft. Wages and uh, the common features were that wages and benefits were unpaid for some workers for periods of up between two to nine months, that there were unilateral salary cuts of between 25 to 75% particularly during the COVID period, and that there was unpaid forced overtime for a number of workers. One thing to really stress here is in our report, we strive very hard to be as objective and balanced as possible. We did document situations where hotel management were seeming to do the right thing. They were complying with the law and with international labor rights standards. There were hotels that were in more recent times, instituting biometric scanning so that it was very clear as to exactly when workers started their job and when they ended it. But it's really important that people realize, especially now as FIFA and their partners will talk about the improvements that have happened in recent months, that the issues that workers have faced and the neglect that these actors have, uh, have made started with the pandemic and of course before that as well. And it's not sufficient to say simply that from now on things will be better and forget what happened to workers in the recent past, especially because we know that in the run up to the World Cup, just before it starts and after it ends, that there will very likely be a significant reduction in the work staff. And we know from the pandemic period when many, many workers were laid off or sent back home, even sometimes not actually formally terminated, that those workers were not paid what was due to them. So it's really important that we resist the temptation to focus on the immediate fixes while the spotlight is on the World Cup and not forget about the structural issues or what might happen afterwards. Um, if you could turn on to the next slide, please. We also found that there was a issue around gender-based violence and harassment, a pattern of gender-based violence and harassment committed by colleagues, supervisors, and guests, and also gender-based restrictions on mobility. Now that meant on that second point that women workers often talked about restrictions in terms of their ability to leave their accommodation, there were curfews or other types of restrictions on them. And really quite shocking situations where, for example, housekeepers would talk about not being able to do their job on their own on a certain floor of a hotel, that they had to be going in pairs and that after they would complain about harassment, including sexual harassment, management's response was to simply move them to another level and get another colleague to take over. One thing to really stress is that we spoke to a handful of women workers about this issue, and it was only a handful because it was very challenging and understandably so to get workers to speak openly about these issues. And the great concern that we have is that this is a very significant issue that we've only just scratched the surface on. And I know that anyone watching this and anyone who might be going to Qatar for the World Cup who's also watching this, that this would be a really big concern. The thought that someone can be terrified in their workplace and have a sense that really the attempts to address and to protect them from that are really not adequate. It's, it's, it was a really huge concern that came out. And again, some very, very powerful testimony comes out from our report. I mean, if we could just move on to the next uh, slide. Another issue that we found was this around overwork and abuse, that hotel staff were made to work very significantly long hours and often with very limited access to food or water or otherwise poor conditions, and that they faced routine harassment. It could have been either from the immediate management, it could have been from other people in, in the hotel or the environment where they were. But it again got, went to the point that I mentioned earlier of the invisibility of this of these hospitality staff. Um, and it was one of the most common issues that we found. If we just move on to the, the next slide, please. 
Another issue, particularly around the pandemic, was workers talking about practices which suggested very significant occupational safety and health risks, and also the issue of abusive downsizing at the height of the pandemic. You know, workers talked a lot about how they did not simply feel safe, that there wasn't enough protections from COVID, or that if they got infected, that the places that they were placed in were simply not adequate to provide them with protection and health services. And that many hospitality chains very aggressively downsized their workforces without adequately compensating workers or notifying them. And as we documented in previous work that we've done, that the governments of Qatar and the other countries we researched, they actually briefly amended their employment laws to make it easy for employers to do that. So it was a very common issue that came out in our research. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So just to end my side is we obviously have tried our very best to be as objective as possible, but also to provide some clear solutions and indicators of what is needed. And so here is a very quick summary of the issues uh, that we feel are really critical to addressing the situation that both FIFA and Qatar and their partners face. We call on FIFA to require partner hotels to demonstrate compliance with international labor standards, including with regard to occupational safety and health and responsible downsizing rules. And that's not just to do with issues that might be happening in the run up to the World Cup, but obviously after the World Cup. Contribute to emergency funds to remedy worker harm. Proactively develop regionally informed and sector specific approaches to labor and human rights, given that what happens in Qatar is also common across the region and that their hospitality partners have presence, not just in Qatar, but in the entire region. And of course, we also call on FIFA to remedy the harms and the lost earnings and other damages that workers have faced and to set aside sufficient funds to compensate for them. We also call on them to support the establishment of a genuinely independent migrant worker center so that workers actually have a seat at the table and that there is a genuine, genuine industrial relations model in Qatar, a safe space also for workers to talk about the issues that they're facing, that no top-down reform process, as positive as it has been, can really address. To Qatar, we call on them to continue the pursuit of international minimum standards. We acknowledge that there have been positive and significant legislative and other reforms, but we want to remind them that they're only just beginning that journey and that the bulk of the reforms have only happened in the last four years and therefore need much more work. We also call them to ensure substantive labour inspections with an eye to post-event risk management and addressing, and of course, embrace the freedom of association. And on the path to respecting that and trading in rights to support the establishment of a genuinely independent migrant worker centre. One thing that really came out from our research was even when workers were aware of the grievance remedy systems set up by FIFA and their partners, and many workers were not, but others were, they said they were too scared to use them. And so we feel very strongly the evidence shows that workers need an independent migrant worker centre. Otherwise, those reforms won't be as effective as they need to be. And of course, lastly, to, to teams and spectators and corporate sponsors, anyone who will be staying at a hotel during the upcoming World Cup is to do adequate human rights due diligence, to ask the right question, and also be brave enough to refuse to stay at hotels if they don't address the issues that we or others have documented in our work. You know, I'm myself a football fan, I'm sure many of you are, and I'm sure that you'd agree with me in saying, and I say that, we'd much rather be celebrating football at the end of the year than feeling really guilty that despite all the hard work that I know many people, including those on this call, have done to try to make the lives of those who are much more humble than us a little bit better, that these issues are still there. We don't have much time, but we still have some time to make their lives better. We recognise that a lot of hard work has been done, positives have been made, but much more needs to be done. Our report talks in quite a bit of detail on ways we feel whatever reforms have been done can be taken further. I'll leave it there. And again, thank you so much to everyone. Again, thank you to GLJ, ILRF, and, and to my colleagues for what has been a, a really important piece of work. Uh, I'll end there. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mustafa. Now we will pass over the mic to Jeffrey Owino. Thank you, Jeffrey, for being with us and for all the work you and your colleagues did uh, talking to workers and making available information about what's actually happening in hotels or uh, in, in Qatar. Thank you, thank you, you're welcome. So Jeffrey, would I think we're not hearing you, um, but would you like to make remarks now? Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Over here it's evening. I don't know where you are, what's the time. My name is Geoffrey. I'm an investigator with the uh, Equidem. And for the last four years, I've been a migrant worker in Qatar. It gives me great pleasure to speak to you about the important uh, I and my colleagues have done for the last two years, giving a voice to the voiceless migrant workers at Qatar World Cup hotels. For me, this isn't uh, a new journey because uh, I have experience of over 15 years back in my country in Kenya. And I actually started from the lower level of a shop steward, graduated to a dispute resolution officer, and finally capped it off with a, an industrial, national industrial relations officer in a union setup. I've equally worked with the social partners like uh, ILO, the civil society, UNI Global, Solidarity Center, and of course our very own uh, central organization of trade unions. That is go to Kenya. Well, I went in Qatar in 2019. I went to Qatar in 20, 2018 in search of greener pastures, of course, because all migrant workers always go abroad for greener pastures. And uh, due to my networks in the labor activism movement, I started receiving uh, distress calls from workers all over the Middle East, whereby my network started growing from one call, from one WhatsApp group of 256 members to 15 WhatsApp groups. And that, and that is just a fraction of uh, what I go through or uh, what I do uh, to help migrant workers. Among the most affected uh, workers related to the World Cup 2022 are hospitality, industry workers, and construction workers, both stadium and the infrastructure involved, because you know there is uh, the rail system, the road network, the communication network. So it's it's quite a, a, a huge, a, a huge sector which is related to uh, preparation for, uh, for the World Cup 2022. I've interviewed dozens of workers and what clearly comes out is disregard to employment contracts. For example, you can see there is no clear disciplinary procedures among um, the companies or among employers. There is no clear labor disciplinary procedures. So the workers are at the mercy of employers. There is no insurance. Sadly, for workers who even died during construction of stadiums, there is no compensation whatsoever for workers who even lost their life during uh, building of this uh, key infrastructure. I have workers who cry day in, day out in desperation because they are trapped. They are trapped in abusive jobs. 
and they stare blankly at me, recounting their experiences of abuse and discrimination. As a father, a husband, and a worker, it's not an easy ordeal, but a necessary one to hear these women and men who feel too scared to speak to anyone else because no one is there to hear them. Some of the serious violations noted in our investigations for the report being launched today include discrimination in the salary scale. For example, I don't see the sense of, of a worker of African origin being paid less than a worker of Arabic or Asian origin for the same job type. We have so many learned Africans, Kenyans to be specific, Ugandans, Ethiopians, earning meager salaries as compared to other nationality workers whose educational credentials are inferior. You don't need any other example. I am a living example of such discrimination. Freedom of expression and freedom of association are other key violations because there are, are many instances where workers have been punished for only sharing videos on social media. A case in point is where an accident has happened or an incident has happened at work related to occupational safety and health of a migrant worker. But if a worker shares that video of somebody who was injured, somebody has fallen from height or something like that, he's punished for that. And for me, that is curtailing of the freedom of speech. Equidem has equipped me with, with guidelines, training, and support on how to identify and watch out for migrant worker labor rights violations, how to interview these workers, and how to educate them on their labor rights. My parting words are for the key players in all this. FIFA and the government of Qatar. FIFA's embodiment is fair play. Actually, it's fair play in capital letters. I've never seen it in small letters. I expect nothing less than fairness in all migrant workers affected by these violations, whether they are still in Qatar or they have left. FIFA and Qatar must compensate for all the lost earnings they have faced due to illegal recruitment charges, unpaid wages, and overtime, discrimination, and harassment. They must also commit to an independent migrant worker center run by workers for workers so that they have a seat at the table with employers and government for safely being able to speak about their work and the living conditions. Finally, there, be, there should be no mass deportations. Rather, seats should be reserved for World Cup workers to enjoy the tournament in the stadiums in Qatar. These are the same workers who have toiled day in, day out through the harsh weather conditions to make the World Cup possible. We aren't asking for much as workers. Please, please respect our dignity. I think that's all from uh, my statement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for your work on the investigation, your analysis, and your powerful voice in why change is urgently needed and, and what that change looks like. Uh, I, I, we're going now to pass to questions and comments, so please do put your questions and comments in the chat, and either Mustafa or Jeffrey or I will 
do our best to answer them. Uh, as you're doing that, I wanted to just emphasize our uh, our perspective is that ensuring labor rights and access to justice and access to remedy for migrant workers requires actions by states. Um, and in this case, we acknowledge there have been some important steps forward by the Qatari government, um, but there is more work to do. It requires act, and it also requires actions by employers, value chains, and investors, many of which are based in the United States and Europe. Uh, and, and in this case, we have not seen steps forward, and there is much, much more work to do. Um, it's very clear this research exposes that the fundamental models of corporate social responsibility and corporate and investor-led due diligence alone without the involvement of workers, worker organizations, and unions is insufficient. I'm very inspired by Jeffrey's um, remarks about how he started as a shop steward and became involved in his union and brought that um, understanding and that vision into his work as a migrant worker. I think that's exactly um, an embodied model of what we are saying must happen for there to be real decent work achieved in Qatar uh, and during the games. Um, I wanted to flag that we we did receive in response to the research uh, responses from Marriott and Accor hotel groups. Those responses are linked in full in the report. Uh, I believe we have some uh, colleagues on the call uh, from those uh, those corporations, uh, and I, I invite them. And this report and research really is an invitation overall for dialogue with FIFA and hotel brands and investors on what it is really going to take to change the conditions in these hotels now to remedy the violations that have happened and the necessary role for workers, work organizations, and unions in that dialogue. The change is not going to happen without it. Uh, we will talk about change, but we will not do change. Um, and, and, and this is a call, uh, this is an alarm bell uh, that four months before the World Cup, um, that that's, that's still what we're seeing. Uh, and so uh, I now want to open it up to questions and comments uh, from the floor. I, I know that we have a, a pretty diverse group um, participating, including some folks from, um, from the media, some folks from other organizations that have been deeply engaged in this work, um, both from Asia, Africa, uh, Europe, and the United States, uh, and others. Uh, so I'm just going to read out the questions, and then we'll uh, assess who is a best to answer them. Uh, the first one is uh, from Kathleen Ryu. Does the research track whether workers have sought any kind of recourse um, and what the response was from employers in the government? I know, um, Jeffrey and Mustafa, that we've spoken about the repression of <laughs> complaint and the real concrete, not only fears, but actual deportations and retaliation that workers have faced. Um, but um, in your conversations, uh, how how was it discussed? What efforts workers have tried, and the um, opportunities or limits of those existing um, those existing efforts? Sure. Yeah. Th thanks, JJ, and thanks, Kathleen, for the question. Um, yeah. So we did actually ask workers this, and there were some instances which we do include in the report. I do apologize that. Much of the information is in the deep, in the longer report that comes out in two weeks. There is some reference in the executive summary. More detail will be in the detail report that comes out in two weeks, um, where, for example, workers who complained about sexual harassment would tell their management, um, and that there would be attempts done to uh, put them uh, from a safeguarding perspective in a safe situation. Um, in other situations, where workers would complain about their wages or other labour issues, where their management would try to address that. But I have to say that those situations were quite rare. There weren't that many situations like that. We did ask a standard set of, quite a detailed set of questions to, to, to most workers. Not all workers did answer them because this was not a survey. It's very, very challenging to do independent research. Workers are very scared to speak out. But workers generally did talk about having a knowledge of the existing um, grievance remedy and other labor compliance mechanisms that have been set up in these FIFA hotels. The vast majority, though, said that they were not comfortable using those mechanisms. They, they did not feel safe enough to, to use them. Now, part of that could be a, a, an attitude or a cultural environment 
rather than that, in fact, those systems do work really well. But I do feel very strongly what that shows you is why you need to have a migrant worker center that is for workers and run by workers and is, is independent because you need to have those mechanisms through which workers feel comfortable to talk about what they're facing and that workers on their behalf can make representations to employers and enterprises and the business community, the authorities to say, these are issues that are coming up. So it's almost like, and I felt this very strongly reviewing the report, having worked now in Qatar for you know close to a decade, is that I know a lot of really good work has been done by state and other actors to, to have labor compliance at these hotels, but you know, it's still missing the mark, not because of a lack of will or genuine effort by those actors, but because of that environment. Um, there, there is no proper industrial relations in, in Qatar. Uh, obviously, industrial relations is a challenge in, in most countries. It's not to say any country has worked entirely out, but the absence has meant that, you know, um, there was some good practice. There wasn't as that much, to be honest. And generally speaking, workers themselves, as, as JJ alluded to, um, that they themselves were self-sensory because they were too scared. Um, I don't know, Joffrey, whether you wanted to, to add to that, given your experiences on the ground. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Mustafa. I agree with Mustafa that uh, industrial relations has been a very big challenge. Even uh, before, he had alluded to a lot of reforms uh, in the in the labor sector but unfortunately most of these reforms are just on paper the trickle down effect has not reached to the worker down there because the, the direct consumer of these laws these reforms all these pr is the worker so i, I, I would say that these laws are more of working in the in the in the in the media or in the press briefings rather than working for the worker. For example, the much touted kafala system. This is where if a worker feels should change in the contract, for example, if a worker feels discriminated, he wants to leave and go to another another employer who is better placed to take care of his interests. It's that it's a nightmare for workers because once you declare your intention of changing companies, go to a better, of course, a better paying company, your employer runs and puts a runaway on your, on your ID. That means automatically you become illegal. It means the next time you meet with the police, you are deported. Remember when you are in a deportation center, you lose your rights even of complaining for you to get your end of service benefits if you had any pending leaves. All those rights are, are lost like that. So you can imagine a worker who has worked for 10 years, a worker who has worked for five years, going home empty-handed. This is the kind of scenario which is there. Of course, there are a few who have succeeded, but over 80, 90% of the workers cannot change employers because this law is, is more pro the employer because the employer has power to deny you that. So I think that is where we, we need to see and, and, and see how we can help these workers more. Thank you. Thanks, Jeffrey. And I, I would just echo uh, what was said previously that um, some of the issues raised in the report, including specifically gender-based violence and harassment against women workers in hotels are, are problems that are endemic in the, uh, in the branded hotel sector worldwide. Um, and we had many hotel workers and their unions that participated in the ILO uh, negotiations around Convention 190 to eliminate gender-based violence and harassment um, and who are part of other uh, global campaigns, um, including one that the IUF, the Global Union Representing Hotel Workers, leads uh, to uh, asking for a global framework agreement on gender-based violence and harassment um, with Marriott to try to address these brand wide around the world. I think what we see in Qatar, as Jeffrey um, highlighted, is layered on top of those difficulties are the threats of retaliation and deportation against migrant workers. 
specifically. So you're threatened not only with losing your job, but with being arrested and detained in a deportation center and then deported back home, potentially losing significant amounts of your wages that are owed to you and not being able to reclaim them, et cetera. And so we see um, layered vulnerabilities of migrant workers along with uh, the problems that hotel workers are facing day to day. Uh, we have a second question uh, before us that is um, in, in the discussions with workers, um, how, do the ho how do the problems raised by hotel workers compare with problems workers are raising in other sectors? Uh, so just wanted to turn that back over to Mustafa and Jeffrey, if there's anything you'd like to say to put the hotel workers in the context of the broader migrant worker issues in Qatar. Thanks, JJ. I'll speak really briefly because I think Joffrey is, is really best place to talk about this. Um, just to say that we're doing uh, a series of investigations into the World Cup. The next one is on um, stadium construction workers that comes out in September. Obviously, there are differences. We're talking about a entirely male worker population, uh, in many ways, a much more physically demanding job that they do in construction. But yes, there are many of the same issues that are being uh, faced by these hotel workers that those workers are talking about and also in, in other sectors as well. I, I would just say that um, the nature of the way that these hotel workers overwork and the gendered harm impacts of these hotel workers is not necessarily unique, but is actually, I would argue, is a crisis. It's a really serious problem. And that, yes, like I said, there have been some real efforts to improve um, situations in these hotels, but um, you know the reality is it's a significant there's significant gaps. And you know um, if you are watching this and you know you're you know you're hopefully concerned about labour rights, but if you're not and you're you know uh, concerned about other things from the corporate sponsors' perspective, there's huge reputational risk in this World Cup. I mean it's that simple. I mean it's even if you don't care about labour rights. It's, it's a huge crisis. And so I think in that way, again, maybe not unique, but I do think that is a fairly unique thing with the hotel sector, as JJ said as well, with her expertise um, on this sector is, um, it's, it's a wide global wide problem, but that's really no excuse, given the tremendous amount of resources into labor compliance that's being poured into, and rightly so, um, in, into Qatar. But um, I'll, I'll hand over to Joffrey, it'd be great to hear uh, your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I think I think uh, uh, there is similarities uh, to these challenges as compared to other sectors, especially the, the sexual harassment part is a, is a big problem. For example, if you look at domestic workers, they can't speak up. They are caged, they are locked inside the houses. The contract says they should have an off every week. There are no off duties. Sometimes even the, the communication gadgets are confiscated. So you see, this is a very big challenge. And to make matters worse, you cannot, you cannot even go outside and go and report these kind of violations. Because there is no protection of worker or there is no witness protection thing like to protect the worker from any harassment immediately. They put a case there. Because, for example, the, 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 the complaint system is, 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 is put in, a, in such a way that if you complain immediately, your employer gets a message. You've complained. Which means within that period of time, before you are called in even for a first hearing, the employer might make it possible for you to be deported outside the country as quickly as possible before the case even takes off. So here, I don't see... If, the worker is protected, especially on this sexual harassment, domestic workers also are facing this very big challenge. And also there's, there's, there's an aspect of, of also race. Because you find out, you find that these uh, blue chip companies, these high-end companies or high-end hotels, these senior management roles or senior management positions are held by locals. So 
in a way or two for those people who understand uh, these uh, Arabic countries, how they operate. Whatever they say is, is like law. So you find you, you getting hurt or you being hurt or something being done. If you have, you have been violated or if your rights have been violated, it's a very big challenge. It's a very big challenge. I think that's my take on, um, on that, uh, on that uh, concern. Thank you, Jeffrey, and I, I appreciate you bringing our uh, our domestic worker sisters into the conversation, um, both as um, bringing their experience, but also um, the International Domestic Worker Federation and their affiliates have done a lot of really important work in this area that has contributed to some of the changes that we have seen, which albeit are not far enough or are, are still important. Uh, I, we have time for one more question. I'm going to um, pass to to Mustafa and Jeffrey for this one is a lightning round, <laughs> so a short response, um, and then I'll I'll close us out with some thanks. Uh, this one comes from um, a colleague who's reporting for the Sunday Mirror um, and wanted to hear a little bit more about the nationality based discrimination that was reported in the research, um, including the differences in wages between Arab and non Arab workers and men and women, um, and wants to hear a little bit more about particularly the Sukal Walker Hotel. So is there any more you can tell us about that, Mustafa or Jeffrey? Sure. Yeah, thanks, JJ. Um, yeah, happy to, to talk about this one. So obviously, this one has got a lot of attention, uh, given the England football team is, is staying there. I should really stress that our investigations actually covered many hotels. And we started interview, uh, researching before we knew which team was staying at which hotels. But um, we can actually email uh, more details to you um, than I'm able to say right now. But to say in general terms that the workers that we spoke to who work there right now, others have in the recent the last one or two years um, have left that hotel, did say that there was variances in their wages. Um, between them and and uh, particularly Arab workers, some talked about even other migrant workers in other countries were paid more than they were paid uh, for the same work. As far as I can recall, uh, there were some situations of workers talking about gender-based discrimination. There wasn't as much information provided with respect to that as in other hotels. But one other thing that really came out of which for me really struck me actually was that workers from quite a, a major manpower agency that had been outsourced uh, to provide workers for the uh, for the hotel. These workers claimed that, you know, approximately half of their wage, their wage was a, was a lawful wage, it was with, uh, I think, slightly above the minimum wage of 1,000 kata rials, which is about a bit over 200 pounds a month. So it's still not a lot of money. But they said that their employer, um, was deducting roughly half of their wage um, as some kind of a you know a, a fee for having them on the site, which is a, a really quite a shocking situation. When you think about the kind of money involved in the facilities that are being provided to the England football team, the cost of one night at one of these hotels, the money being made by that enterprise, and of course that the kind of earnings that England footballers and other footballers are making, and of course FIFA will make from the tournament. It's really quite shocking. And one thing, you know, one message we have for the England football team is, you know, we know with the team and their manager, these are quite thoughtful people. They've often said very powerful things about human rights and equality. You know, they've been taking the knee on the football pitch, you know, thinking about racial discrimination. Well, this is a question that really needs to be asked, but have you really done adequate due diligence and it's not just, and I really stress this, I know it sounds a bit strange to say this, but about making sure that these workers are getting paid what they're owed. There's a structural issue here that really comes out in our work, which is that workers don't have the space to be part of the industrial relations picture. That's why they can get treated that way. And that's why the England football team should be supporting efforts to set up an independent, genuinely independent migrant worker centre run by migrant workers for migrant workers and why FIFA, England Football Association and other stakeholders should set aside, you know, a large enough amount of funding to compensate workers for unpaid wages and other damages 
that have been caused to them at the England ho- football team hotel and at the other hotels where football teams and others will be congregating for this World Cup. Thank you, Mustafa. Um, Jeffrey, we're over time, but I wanted to uh, ask if you have a final quick comment before we close out. Uh, I think mine is just a short or quick one. Just like uh, Mr. Mustafa said earlier, there are huge risks here, especially on uh, nations which are known for respect of human rights and the rule of law. Because you can imagine, um, like the nation, the, the England national team uh, staying in the soup, yet the worker there is in a, in, a, in a position which is quite unfortunate. So I, I feel that uh, I think we still have some little time whereby they can still put pressure, to make a, 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 a statement which can make things happen, especially things which might affect a migrant worker to get something better from what they are getting now. Because in the long run, if they get embroiled in such a thing, I think there is a reputational risk which will happen. Because I know maybe after the World Cup, there will be a lot of issues on, on, on these matters. So I, I, I just want to urge all nations which are law abiding, which respect human rights, which respect workers to kindly. Let them give out their voice. Let them raise their voice so that we can get this done well before the World Cup happens. I think that's all I can say for now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, and I, I do want to add, we don't have time for a full discussion, but there's a, a, a reference by um, a reference in the chat um, that we should pay attention to temporary staffing agencies, the recruiters, the the whole um, set of actors along supply chains and subcontractors and value chains. Um, and I think that's a very important point that did come up in the research that it, it sometimes, um, you know, money is going to one entity and being stolen. I, I remember a, a migrant worker colleague that once told me that he feels like a pile of money and just everywhere he goes, someone is taking some of it and there's nothing left for his family at the end. And so we know that these these structures of employment um, and supply chains and value chains have that impact and that they're not accidental. They could be changed just like the quality of the hotel and the branding um, is monitored very carefully. It could the, that wages are being paid directly to the worker fairly, that discrimination is not happening, that health and safety conditions are there. This also could be um, could be attended to um, and could be responsible for those at the top of the value chains. Um, before we close, there's um, and I'm there's a number of uh, people. Uh, a research like this takes a huge amount of people <laughs> to conduct, and the majority of the most important people, who are the colleagues of Jeffrey and the migrant workers themselves, go unnamed uh, because they would face retaliation for participating. So we honor them and lift them up and their work um, without their names. There are some names though that, of people that are uh, both on and off the call that I want to also lift up who participated in very fa- in several phases of this work over many years. Um, and that includes Namrata Raju, Deepa Tapalia, Amanda Sperber, Rameshwar, Spencer Nelson, and Shika Bhattacharji, among many others um, who I apologize if I have forgotten, who have all contributed in really important ways to the research, the report, and this uh, this what we hope will be an initial beginning discussion here um, that will carry on for the next four months um, when we have much work to do before the World Cup in Qatar, and then which carries on into 2026. And there is also, also I would say, a robust discussion that is beginning to happen um, in Mexico, the US and Canada. The 2026 bid is the first uh, transnational bid. We call it the United Bid. Um, and it's, it's very encouraging to me to see that uh, workers are already asking questions about how do we build on the uh, the the efforts that have happened in Qatar to raise human and labor rights, to raise conditions. We're not going to forget about it. We're going to keep fighting now um, to make the conditions better for the games in Qatar, but also how can that build uh, towards a better game also in 2026. So thank you all for uh, 
for being here today. Thank you, many of you, um, for the work that you do um, on these issues all around the world. Uh, and we hope that we'll continue. I'll just pass to Mustafa for any final comments. Thanks, JJ. Not really much else to say. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Again, just echo what you said. Thank you to the incredible hard work of everyone who worked on this. And also thank you to everyone who's joined um, this launch. It's so important that we hear your voices as well, that you're talking to your stakeholders. You're, if you're a journalist that you're covering these issues, we'll certainly be covering these issues uh, with the World Cup coming up and of course, future tournaments. But again, that's it for me as well. Thank you so much to everyone for joining this event um, and we will speak to you very soon.